different uh, data sets from, was it Kaplan? Is that right? And I'll show you the other thing that I kind of got done. It's not as good, so that's why I decided not to share it. I get, ended up with a lot of different data and figuring out my biggest problem here was figuring out how to take the data that I had. Look over here. You see, this is just a simple. Hey, Jim, if you, if you this would, is all it is. if you yeah. would kind of back up a little bit and start from the beginning of what. I'm sorry. What problem set? What, what, what is, what okay. are we going to look at? What, you know, what okay. was interesting you, that kind of thing? So the, I found uh, a couple of things on vehicles, use cars was the thing, believe it or not, that I came with, uh, that I went with. I have two used car data sets. Let me pull this out of the way. So the first one here was um, the type of car, the city and highway models per gallon and is a gas or a diesel. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, but when I did my pivot table here and I started doing my, um, my charts and trying to visualize it. Well, I've got, now I got this down here. I ended up with something like this and just had a devil of a time trying to get this chart so that it made any sense at all. So I decided to go back and rework what I was looking at. And there was actually two data sets for used cars that I was looking at, uh, that one and this one. And believe it or not, this one with all the extra rows and columns was the one that turned out being the easiest for me to, to decipher, at least in a way that other people could see it. And I played around, around with a few things because what I was really interested in was what's the gas mileage average for used cars on the market, or at least within the data set. Because I was curious, you know, I can remember having uh, a 1989 Pontiac that got 30 miles to the gallon. I have a Mazda now that gets about the same thing, maybe a little better, but it's a bigger, heavier car. Um, so I was just, for some reason, that just struck me as, well, gee, I wonder what it looks like now. Now, I'll caveat before I should start showing um, uh, the chart that I ended up with. This data set, from what I'm gathering, Alfa Romeo, Audi, BMW, Chevy, Dodge, is most likely European in origin somewhere there uh, because it not only talks about, um, well, just from the make and model, but also fuel efficiency is measured in miles per gallon and liters per, was it 100 or one per 100 kilometers, um, which is how things are measured across the pond. So this is European. I can't testify that the statute, that the mile are the same, but it's a, because, you know, you have imperial and standard and all these different types of miles. So it could be different than what we use in America, but it's a, it's an easier thing for, I think for us to grasp, because if you use liters per hundred kilometers, the smaller number is better, not the bigger number. So that's kind of where I went with this. Um, what I ended up with, with was just comparing make of the car and then average fuel economy based on standard aspiration versus turbo. I was curious, is there really that big a difference? Well, the, things, the thing that I found that was kind of surprising, at least for me, was one, in most cases that I was able to find, like Volvo, for instance, there's really not a lot of difference between a standard aspirated engine and a turbo aspirated engine, at least in the cars on the market now, for used cars on the market now, they're really comparable. The ones that were different are Volvo, I'm sorry, Volkswagen, for instance, um, which I kind of take that with a grain of salt given the testing scandal they had a few years ago, but they had a significant increase in average fuel economy for used cars in the turbo um, aspirations instead of just the standard or normally aspirated engines. Um, Plymouth was exactly the opposite. It was, if you put a turbo on a Plymouth, then you're gonna lose about, on average, about 10, uh, 10 miles to the gallon. Um, this right here, getting this so that was, it was actually, and here's the thing that is kind of suspect for me, 46 miles to the gallon 
for a Chevy, uh, something something's not right there. <laughs> At least if it's a, the models that we're used to dealing with. One of the hardest things that I had with this was trying to get this so that it, would, it made sense here. And what I ended up doing, I, I play with a lot of stuff. And what I ended up doing was actually playing with the, um, oh, hold on. Where is it? How do I get the box back? The I know, thing. right? The uh, How do I... I just right, did it. Right click on it maybe and say format chart area or format. Is that what you're looking for? No, not that one. It's the, it's the pivot table fields. Uh, field oh, there you got to go to your one. pivot table. Oh, there you go. There it's you go. that one. It's field list. That's what it was. What I ended up doing to get this was, was uh, cause I was just using a recommended pivot table, recommended pivot chart was kind of the way that I went. Because I was just, I just want to use the stuff that I had pulled into the pivot table. Um, and what I found, and, and what I found was, I didn't realize this before. This moving this aspiration to series was the thing that got me where I wanted to be. Before it was here, and it looked like this, which is fine. But I really wanted to have different colors for turbo versus standard. So if you move the aspiration to access category, it breaks it down here, and you know that that works. But I could not make in this field one blue and one orange or one other. I can make all of them different colors, which doesn't help me. But the goal for me was to try to get turbo and standard in, in you know, in common colors, all turbo one, all standard in the other. Could not get it. Um, so, so like a stacked bar chart, but kind, kind had, of. I mean, you I, had I to like, do it with the pivot table instead of with right, the chart I, itself. Exactly. I <laughs> like this uh, format, but I couldn't get the colors to change. Ah, like yeah. that. I, okay. So I wanted like one blue and one orange, but playing around with the pivot table fields, just moving the aspiration. So instead of it mm -hmm. being here it's <clears throat> in the legend, yeah. Go. Now I'm getting it here. And I had to play with it again to get because I would have one show up with numbers and one not. And I forget exactly what I did to get it well, there, but I managed to get it so that you could tell the difference between the two. If you uh, don't mind, can. Can we try something, Jim? Sure. Put, put, I would put, anything. put aspiration down under make like you like you had it where where it's the two okay. blue bars. Yeah. And now if you right click on say this this the standard, right click on that. Standard. No, on in the bar. Yeah, the blue bar by standard. Oh, any yeah. one of any one of them. Got it. Right click on it. <laughs> I was thinking, well, I tell you what, how about maybe double clicking it so that you're, you're looking at all of them. Now that, that one worked right click on it. And it brought up like a, you know, the paint color palette above it. Right. Right click on it. And then, uh, above. Yeah. Turn that to Outline. red, that shape fill to turn that to, to fill to like red or whatever and see what it right. just does it for that one. Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Normally, yeah, that was the problem I was having. Um, I went up here to, I'll show you something, a couple of other things I tried. I tried the format under, no, what was it? Uh, change colors, I think. Yeah, the palette here. And it was, it was still all monochromatic. It was just a different, a different color. Um, so the problem I was, I was having, and if someone has an answer, I'd love to hear it, is how do I, in a chart like this, how do I assign colors to these classifications, these subclasses here? I, I could not figure that out. Well, when you when you upload it, I'll I'll play around with it, see what. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. Thank you. I hope it wasn't too boring. I, it's got to be better than the than the sailing stories. I hope. <laughs> no, that's exactly what I was looking for. Uh, you okay. guys having time. Uh, to just, you know, goof around and nothing to me is a better teacher than mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, yeah. Banging your head against. And, and then when you finally get it to work, uh, it's the, the, the aha <laughs> epiphany. <Yeah. laughs> finally. Good grief. It. Good grief. That's how that works. Uh, so there you go. All right. Cool, man. Yeah. So there's a there is an assignment in the classroom. Right. Under under Excel called uh, 
Excel data analysis project or something obvious like that. Um, so yeah, if you, if you guys would all upload, uh, if it's just one, you know, if it's just a, a workbook, that's fine. But um, if you'd upload whatever files are associated with what you're doing this morning, um, sure. I, I, I'm sure shooting you guys, when you guys are going through things, you'll, you'll show something that I'm like, Ooh, I want to play with that. I want to learn more about that or whatever, you know? Um, so I, I, if, in addition to everybody, you know, getting credit for, for moving along with the course, um, I appreciate the, uh, the, um, the additional data sets to goof around with for my own, uh, fun and enjoyment. All right, cool. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go in order of people on my, my screen. So Leela. Good morning. Jim, can you hit uh, stop share? I think maybe if you go to the, there we go. Leela, there you go. I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? You're showing as unmuted, but uh, I can't hear Leela. Can it? No, Leela, I can't hear you. Can anybody hear Leela? No. No. You want to like unplug your unplug your mic and plug it back? Yeah, that's I'm sure that's what she's doing. Um, how about now? Nope. I was gonna say, Leela, we can move on if you want to. If you want to take a minute. Okay, Leila, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and move on, okay? Uh, and we'll we'll come back to you. Uh, don't let me forget, everybody. Don't let me forget coming back to Leila after. Next up, Paul. Ah, I see you. Yep, she's trying switching headsets. Good morning, Paul. Uh. I'm in the restroom right now. I'll go next if you don't mind. Um, I'm on my phone. Oh, you're on your phone. I, I I didn't catch all of that, Paul. Do you need a minute as well? Yeah, I'm indisposed at the moment. <laughs> indisposed. Okay. Well, we will come back. Uh. Well, we said we'd come back to Leela. Did you have a chance to switch headsets, Leela? Not just yet. Okay, Hampton. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Okay, let me share my screen with you all. Okay. Take it away. Can you all see? Looks good. Okay. So um, when I began my search for a data set, I kind of wanted to look into something with social media or podcasts, because those are both things that um, I find very interesting and work with. And also, I listen to a ton of podcasts. So I wanted to find a data set that maybe was top podcast or top um, Instagram, or yeah, Instagram account. So that's what I found. I found Instagram. Um, the ones I really manipulated were Instagram and Twitter accounts. So to begin with Instagram, and I found this on Kaggle, I guess that's how you say it. Um, but for Instagram, I thought it was interesting to maybe look where the majority um, of these users are from. So I did the location. So um, here's a chart and most of them were in the United States in the top 50. And then this kind of breaks it down some of the others. Um, and then I also did a pie chart for this one. Um, and I put the numbers on the outside. I felt like that was easiest to read. Um, I kind of thought about putting slicers in here, um, but I did that on the Twitter one. 
So for the Twitter one, I did an occupation breakdown. So what they're known for, whether it was like sports related, music, actress, actor. So this one I did for sports for the first um, breakdown. And these were the top sports accounts in the top 50. So, um, and I could go in here and change if I wanted to do comedians or whatever, so. So occupation is a column in the original data? Yes. Got it, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually had a question for you all, if, you all, if anybody knows an answer. Um, shoot, I don't think I have it pulled up. Well, I, I will ask later. I had one that I downloaded a column in, in the millions. It had some weird format that I wanted to take away for the entire column, but um, I don't have that pulled up right now. So I can go back to that later. Was it like but in yeah. sci scientific notation or something? It was weird. It was, um, it was like in a different formula the way it was exported. So, hmm. but I can, I can email that over to you later. Cool. But yeah, so that was my breakdown. I didn't play around with YouTube or TikTok or Facebook yet. Um, I just kind of wanted to focus on these as I was most familiar with these. But yeah. Interesting. Go go over to your YouTube data and sort it sort it by subscribers. Man, millions of subscribers. None of the people I follow have anywhere near that. What do you want me to sort by? Uh, uh, by subscribers. You, I think you're doing it now. Are okay, you, large, large, uh, to small. large to small. Yeah, yeah. Actually, okay. do small, do smallest to large. I'm, how many, uh, how many rows are, of data do we have here? Fifty. Top 50. Oh, it's the top. Okay, yeah, it's the top fifty. Mm -hmm. No kidding, millions. Katy Perry. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting. I mean, you know, we definitely have the Kardashians and whatnot at the top, the Instagram and. Twitter, but then um, there was definitely some other ones that I thought were pretty interesting that were in there. So that was yeah. cool to look at. Stuff I've never heard of. There yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks, Hampton. Yeah, thank you. And, and yeah, if uh, when you upload this, um, maybe send me a note with that weird format. I'm curious to see what what happened or if there was any way to yeah, it's going to be a different workbook, but um, I'll upload it and I'll specify which one it is. All right, cool. And thank y'all. All right. Let's see. 8.58. Got time for another couple. Um, did we lose? Did Leela get out? Looks like she's rebooting. Uh, next up, Regina. Good morning. I like your profile picture, Regina. Very holiday -y -y -y. Regina? What? I can go now if you want me to. You just dropped off. Yeah, welcome back, Paul. Uh, Regina keeps dropping out. Love technology. Go ahead, Paul. Yep, I muted myself. All right, uh, one more second. I have a couple of different projects. Um, I did one for work and then I just did one for this that I'll turn in. Okay. Sounds good. I'll go ahead and show you the one that I'm going to turn in. Can you all see that? Yep. All right. So this was health cost utilization data that I found in that data.gov website you provided us. And I just wanted to focus on um, the event and then like if they were hospitalized and then uh, it also shows their mortality rate in the hospital. So I've created a filter by year. So right now it's displaying all years. And this is the percentage of these patients who 
uh, you know, suffered an acute mitocordial infraction or just a heart attack, uh, these in, and so on and so forth. And then I just use recommended pivot tables to kind of visually represent it. I feel like this does a pretty good job at providing a quick glance of what the data is trying to tell you. And then I'll show you guys the one I did for work. Did, did that one pop up? I'm still seeing the uh, the other one. The healthcare, yeah, the myocardial infarction. Uh, Always gosh. thought that was funny. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can get it to. I'll just do the whole screen. Okay, y'all see the new one now? Yes. All right, so I was tasked with trying to produce a turnaround metric. Um, so here I was able to run a function called network days in Excel. And basically it just does the math between a start date and end date, and it excludes all weekends and holidays. Um, this one doesn't exclude holidays because I didn't create, you have, you have to create a uh, reference table for all holidays. Um, but since this was just for the mo a month, um, that was okay. And over here, I was able to provide basically a count of how many times um, this turnaround appeared in the, in, the, in the month, and then just using recommended pivot uh, tables again. Um, I feel like this, you know, it, it still provides a pretty accurate, quick glance of what the data needs to tell you. That is a histogram, right? Of yeah. Of those, yes. And that's what I've been working on. Okay. So tell me again about the function you used. Um, ne network? Ne yeah, when you, you said network. Yeah, it's, something. It's, it's, it's a formula that, uh, yeah, you just type in equal network days. Ah. I, think, I think it depends on if you're working on a Mac or a PC. There is another one called that, but uh, at the end it has dot .ins. That one tends to work better on Mac, Mac machines. And then PCs, you can get away with just using equal network days. So basically, it's just, um, I can type it really quick. I was going to say, well, click in the cell. It's in there, isn't it? Well, no, I copied and pasted. Uh, the values so and they, they just did the values. Dependent. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So they wouldn't yeah. be dependent on the formula anymore. That way, if the rows get changed around, the data right. is still there. That's important, guys. Remember, that's paste values. Because a lot of times, you don't want the formula. You want the actual right. derived data. There you go. Network. Yeah, so these are the two versions that pop up. And so whenever you do it, um, I can just go ahead and show you how it works. You click on the like the start date and then comma end date. And it well, it should give you the 12 days that were there. But this one probably wants the dot ins one. Of course, it's going to mess up on a live demo. Oh, but sure. You can't do a software demonstration. <laughs> it's I, it's I -N -T -L. I -N -T -L. There you go. Yes, that's what it is. Okay, so this was our start date, comma, end date. And then it, it just does the math for you. There you go. And then the colors, is that a conditional formatting? What? It, it is. Uh, so I just did a gradient of, you know, whatever took the longest to be a darker red and whatever took the least amount of time was in the brightest green. Yeah, that's like a suggested palette that comes up when you do right. conditional formatting, right? There you go. All right, cool. Let's see where we're at. There we go. Um, let me go out to my email real quick here, guys, and see if... if we got a... Oh no! From Hampton or I mean from Leela or no? Looking okay. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Regina. OK, 
Can you hear me okay? Regina might have stepped away from the microphone, I guess, uh, just for a moment. Uh, Hunter. Hey. Good morning. The screen up. And y'all, if y'all, if y'all have questions for each other, please jump in, please. <laughs> All right. Can you guys see my Excel file here? Yes. Awesome. Um, so the data set I chose was actually a, uh, it was a video game sales list uh, data set. Um, chose it because it was the least depressing one I saw quickly on Kaggle. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, here's the breakdown of the actual, um, what this data set what actually does is it it looks through through the years uh, 1980 to 2020, and it lists the, the games that sold a hundred at least a hundred thousand copies, um, and then it also ranks those based on the total number of copies sold. Um, and it was just generated by a scrape of a specific website that keeps track of that sort of thing. Um, so here is the initial data that I actually got from Kaggle. Uh, this was just copied and pasted uh, from a CSV that I downloaded. Uh -huh. you know, this is the rank, the name of the game, the platform of the game, the year of release, genre, publisher. Um, and I need to remember the order. North America sales, EU sales, J Japan sales, other sales, and this is the global sales so it should be a sum of these um first thing i did i like putting things in tables because i can look at it a lot quicker especially when it's you know sixteen thousand uh entries um after that this is a pivot table that takes a look at the platform specifically um and then takes a takes the sums of each platform and uh, for for each specific region. So uh, GBA is Game Boy Advance. Um, they all games sold in those years uh, generated 187.54 million uh, in North America. This much in that 75.25 uh, in, in the European Union, 47.33 in Japan. Um, and this is the sum of the other sales. These are the big three, and this is everywhere else. Um, and then, as you can see, I have some slicers that, you know, it might be good to look at um, maybe from year to year. Like maybe you're a rival game company and you want to uh, say, I'm looking at uh, what sold the best where, uh, on which platform, um, or let's say I want to look at this publisher. And you can see that they sold better on PS4 than they did on Xbox One um, in 2016. And yeah, uh, this is one of them. The other thing I did was that's uh, cool. No, that that that's really the, cool, Hunter. I, I I like it. This is the sum of global sales. So this is uh, just a total of the, all the money uh, made by genre a game. Um, still, you can slice it by year and publisher. Um, decided to go with a pie chart for this one. It, it seemed right. Um, and you can, like, let's say you want only want to look at action games. And then, or ah, not what I wanted to do. You want to look at action puzzle. Let's say you're trying to decide between those three. Uh, you reset this filter, reset this filter. There we go. And you can see that over the last 20 years, action games have sold uh, a significant, significantly more than platform of puzzle games. And so you might want to look into 
making an action, putting money behind an action game versus a platform or a puzzle game. Um, yet again, broken down by year and specific publisher if you want to look at a specific publisher. Uh, this is the fun one. Um, this is just counting genre, counting the number of games in a genre versus, uh, well, initially it counts the number of games that were produced for each genre. And you can slice it by year, platform, and publisher. Um, but I also have it so that you can even break it down by publisher onto the pivot chart. As you can see, it's not, it's not easy to format this. I just wanted to get it to a spot where we can, all, we can see, see the chart. Um, so like action games, these publishers during that time actually pr produced action games and this is how many they produced. Um, let's say do multi-select. Uh, it's a big chart. Yeah. Should turn off multi-select. So you might also have a problem with slicers where you'll sometimes move them instead of clicking on what you want to click on. No, I tend to just do quick and dirty, whatever yeah. simplest is makes my boss happy. So that's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> so like in 2016, it'll take a second to actually filter this data down. Um, action games, the number that was produced. So let's say you are specifically looking at action, you're an action game maker. Um, and this, this, this would list your competitions, um, what you should be looking at, uh, who you should be directly competing with, or maybe you should look into a different genre. Um, and it's broken down by genre and publisher. Yeah. Interesting. There's a lot of different ways you could slice this. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not a video game uh, aficionado, but I've certainly yelled at the TV. This thing cheats. I've, <laughs> oh, uh, plenty of times, right? Uh, well, we uh, we started out with regular Nintendo uh, when my kids were little, and then we got the Super Nintendo. And I and Super Nintendo is, as far as consoles go, is is kind of where I stopped playing them. But then I got pulled into PC run around first person shooter games um, in the early 2000s when you know high speed really high speed internet came out and um, and you could use a headset to collaborate you know um, <laughs> that that was a game changer to me and I, I I just about you know quit being a husband and father <laughs> after yeah. work so that I could sit down and run around wake island or whatever you know shooting each other with the my buddies all right any questions guys uh i was wondering if uh if, if i don't want to spend too much time on it but while, while, looking at it it made me wonder how hard it is to change the column in a pivot table how hard is it to change the column to something meaningful like row labels over platform right now um that Instead of saying row labels, that should say platform. Is that, yeah, I don't is, know why. I don't know why that is that hard. Is, if we bring up the pivot table fields, like I know you can rename. Um, it should say like like some of NA sales, that sort of thing. I know you can rename those. You just go to the uh, the value field settings. Yeah, yeah, hit that field settings thing there. Uh, uh, custom name platform. Didn't seem to have an effect. Huh. Yeah, no, right? It says row labels. That uh, I'll have to. I'll have to. Um, there you go. Ah, there you go. You just click in the cell and rename yeah. it. The easiest yeah. possible way. <laughs> Gosh, it's almost like somebody at Microsoft was. Uh, thinking about us out here. So there you go. So you can, you can, yeah, change the column 
name in the pivot table. And you can also um, do it right here. Right there in the, yeah, in the, uh, in the cell itself. Cool. Mm -hmm. There you go. All right. Thanks, Hunter. Let's see where we're at. Uh, boom, Regina popped out right, right then. <laughs> and Leela has not been back. Um, has anybody seen Leela come in and out? Um, let me shoot her. I'm not. Let me shoot her a real quick email. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Well, we can definitely move on. Okay, last to go was Hunter and Hampton went. Regina, can you hear me? We've seen you popping. Yes, I can. Are. I'm sorry. I was trying to get off mute. There we go. Good morning. Yeah, I know. Good morning. So many different tools to do this video teleconferencing with. Okay, you ready to go? Yes. Okay. Take it away. We'll take a break right after this one. Is there anybody talking or I can't hear or see anything? I I cannot. Uh, Regina, you were unmuted and then you said okay and then you got went back on mute. The uh, the controls are down at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. Okay, can you guys hear me now? We can. And she's gone. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, Colton, you ready to go? Uh, yes, I am. All right. One second here to share my screen. Oh, man. Um, can you guys see that? Coming up, coming up, bam, looks good. All right, so to be honest, um, I was looking for a very specific data set uh, on defensive play calling in the NBA. And so I spent probably uh, the majority of Tuesday morning looking for that and never found it. And so I, uh, I had to do this yesterday after I spent like four hours in Excel at work too. So it was a real fun time. Um, so this is players, their position and salary. I had to pull the position using X lookup from another sheet. Um, and then I have like various, like these are box scores. Uh, well, average of box scores. This is like per 100, which is to remove like um, the effect that minutes has on a player's stats. Uh, and then there's some selected advanced stats. And so originally I, what I was going to do was look at what teams played the most zone defense and how that impacted how good their defense was. And if possible, maybe like how good some players are against zone defense. And I, I had some hypothesis on that, but since I couldn't find that data or, well, since I found the data, but you have to buy a $6,500 membership to access it. So I, I ended up trying to resort to this. So my idea was, to find, um, what's the way to phrase this? Find value players where they're providing a lot, but they're on a smaller salary than normal. So, and the other, the other problem I had, let me see if any of these are still like it. 
Um, some of the sheets, the names, a lot of players are from like international countries. And so they'll have uh, uh, interesting names. Do I sound okay? Yeah, just squawk there for a second. But um, yeah, those accents and whatnot, um, that, I mean, that's how you really spell it, especially in the native. Yeah. Uh, but that will mess you up trying to like oh, yeah. import that data uh, into like, I, I had a bunch of uh, special characters in, in a data set and it, it would choke when I tried to do an import into uh, MySQL. So yeah, beware of special characters. Yeah, I'm trying to find, I had to go through, I spent a ton of time just trying to go through and fix the names. Cause when I imported it, it was using like special characters like at in the middle of people's names. So when I'm trying to do X lookup, it was not working. But uh, I digress. I, uh, I pull all this data in and I use X lookup there to get their salaries. And then um, this is another question I had is, does anyone know how to use X lookup and perform an operation on an, like, for example, uh, this number here from XLOOKUP, does anyone know a way to take this number and perform an operation on it in the same cell? So I tried putting it in parentheses like the, that. I was going to say, like, using using the XLOOKUP as if it were, like, a square root a function number. or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I tried doing that, but it, it, it did not do it. Did it just work that time? Because this song gonna be really mad. It didn't air. Yeah, it worked. Wow. Okay. Well, that's annoying. I could not get. Well, to it, it works in that cell. The error you might have gotten uh, is if you tried to do more than one cell and there was weird data in the in in any one of them. But that yeah, and I think it was also because I was I was not hard coding the number in. I was trying to do it like, for example, like this, like B two. But it's working then too. So I don't know what my <laughs> problem was, but that's about how it goes. There you go. Anyways, so I uh, I took all of these different box scores or advanced stats divided by the salary. This of course gives you a nice scientific notation. Um, and then I did the actual pivoting here. So I did a couple of things because I didn't really know what to do with this information. So this is just a count of how many players there are of each position in the league. And then I used, um, I think there is, man, I can't remember. This should be average salary, but I don't know why the data labels are not there. It's not average salary. I think it's because I changed the pivot table when I was doing this. Like I said, it was a rough time. I spent all day yesterday in Excel at work. Hey, you could, uh, you could add, uh, yeah, in the field list, drag drag salary down there, and in yeah. the value field setting, say average salary. I think I did have that, but it was messing up another uh, another and, field. Yeah, and you want average salary, not some. Yep. You're all over it. Yeah. That's what I had originally, but since I'm using the same pivot table, is there a way to modify charts independent of pivot table? Mm, I think if it's a chart based on the pivot table, they tend to be dynamic. You would have to like yeah. save it Except as an image or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The point is, yeah, so I did, I did, originally this was a count of all the different positions and then this was average salary by position. So point guard is clearly the highest. Um, and then this right here is those different stats divided by salary. Since it's in scientific notation, I thought the best way to view it would be to rank it. Um, but for some reason, it will not let me sort these different columns. And so I'm not exactly sure why that is. Um, but when I sort them, let's see. When I sort them, it doesn't move the names because even if I select the names, I could not get it to, to sort it, which makes it kind of hard to view. You have to scroll through it, which is not my favorite. Let me do that. Yeah, see, it wouldn't let me sort when I select the name as well. And if I don't expand the selection, then it just moves it and it, it just kind of messes everything up. 
So, well, if you would, that's what I'm talking. Yeah, well, well, email that to me. I, I, I'd love to look it up. And, and so, you want to sort by like rank? Yeah, and that also should be. See, I also did conditional formatting, but it mm -hmm. looks like for some reason some of them did not highlight the highs. Uh, like I wanted them to, because in my, I mean, if it's a low score, that's good. If it's a high score, it's bad. And I know that this data is correct. I know that these rankings are correct because I actually, you see a player with a lot of green in their, in their row. These are players that are like right now in the running for like most improved player or rookie of the year and things like that. So, I mean, it's accurate, but it's just been, it's been a funky, a funky little experience trying to mess with it. But yeah, that's I'll that's, take that. Put put that in the end of course feedback for me, Colt. It's <laughs> been a funky little experience. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, if you would, if you would um, you know, I wanted to sort the pivot table in the pivoting, I think it was this worksheet was called pivoting. Uh yeah. I wanted to sort by whatever column and it won't let me or whatever. Uh I I'd I'd love to Google it, take a look at it. But we yeah, are cool. We are good job. We are past break time. Um Regina, you what you came off mic and said, Can you hear me? And then bam. Um, I know my internet died, so I'm on my out. phone now. <laughs> okay, well Sorry darn. Um uh well it's past break time so let's uh let's take a break and um can you are you going to be able to present or is your phone your only your only way of zooming in right now uh, my phone is the only way to zoom in but i'm gonna try to see if i can uh use my cell phone as a hot spot and oh, okay connected. all right well, well we'll take a 15 plus let's come back at uh cell phone time 9 45 okay 15 minute break let everybody and uh hopefully we'll find leela she she disappeared okay. too <laughs> okay guys see you at 9 45 okay for various reasons but you know, I don't have, you know, a data set necessarily because every time I went out and looked at them to download them, you had to join them and set up an account. And honestly, I was a little hesitant about downloading stuff externally onto my work computer. But so I just went and got data and copy and pasted and used that. But I have since talked to my IT person and he's like, yeah, you should be OK as long as it's just like an Excel file or a CSV file. And yeah, the system if, should scan it. But I just I'm always a little I'm a little cold footed about downloading stuff to the work computer from an external site, you know. Mm -hmm. Understood. But now that I know, I'll just add to what I did and, and just you know enhance it, if you will. Okay. So you ready to go or you want to go Tuesday? Okay. Uh, no, I can I can go ahead and show you what I got. All right. Whenever you're ready. I'm ready. All right. Let me uh let me get here to share the screen and get that form up. Can y'all see my screen? Not yet. Oh, hang on. I'm sorry. There now you should be up there. Coming up, bingo. Looks good. Okay, so uh, I started out honestly with I want I had about a seven or eight different things I wanted to I, I was going to try. Um, one of them had to do with the type or color of your vehicle and speeding tickets, <laughs> and then I got on this baseball kick, and so I wanted to look at home runs and kind of look at whether there were more hit in a in a period in indoor stadiums or outdoor stadiums, and then the total number hit by certain people. But when I looked at those data sets, they were so massive, there was so much information. And then it got to where, like I was telling you before, I was a little hesitant about downloading them to my work computer from an outside source. But 
I have since talked to my IT guy. So what I did, the other thing that I'm kind of geeky about is air disasters. I watched this show on Smithsonian Channel, being an air crew guy all my career. I watched a show on Smithsonian called Air Disasters, and it goes through air investigate, you know, crash investigations and stuff. And I'm kind of interested in that stuff. So I looked at uh, I looked at air uh, fatalities, uh, fatal air crashes over a period of time. This this stuff right here comes straight from the NTSB, and as you can see, it's not necessarily a raw data set as much as it's a table with a bunch of data in it. So. Um, I took this information here and I kind of extracted some of it and uh, um, transposed it, if you will, to put it in the, these long columns, you know, um, just and then I turned it into a table that I could filter out. And then I took some of the years away. The, the, the uh, information I had before was from like 1960 all the way through 2020. And so just because of sheer size and the charts I was putting up I just want I scaled it down a little bit just for this exercise just to play around with Excel a little bit if that makes sense um, so here's the data that I took out of that table basically total fatalities um, serious injuries total accidents total accidents that were fatal and then flight hours by the thousands and then the fatality rates per 100,000 flight hours and so really what I was kind of looking at is just, I wanted to see if there is a, a definite decline in fatalities, is air traffic travel getting safer because of the things that we've learned in all of these accidents that we've had. So I slimmed it down a little bit more from there to a 40 year total in five year increments, just so, and, and I put a, a little chart to it. Um, and uh, so I know that the, the fatalities, the fatality rates for 100,000 hours are kind of hard to see because they're so minimal, really, figuratively. I mean, you know, in, in real terms, they're kind of minimal as we get further on in years from 1980 up into, into, the, into 2020. And, and so then I used a little uh, formula just to play around here. Just the fatality rates for 100,000 hours are just the, uh, total fatalities divided by um, divided by the flight hours in the thousands and then you just multiply it by a hundred to get to get your decimal where you want it. So you can see here just on the table that fatality rates per hundred thousand flight hours has definitely gone down um, since 1960 although this only shows 1980 to 2020. it's certainly on the on a decline. And so when I looked at that, I, I kind of went a little bit further and, and I, so I wanted to put it in a little bit of a different chart to show, with a trend line. Um, I played around with pivot tables and I was just, I don't know, I, it, what it told me was I need to go back and rewatch the lesson on pivot tables because I was just getting too much. I was, I was struggling with, with uh, when you pull up that, the uh, pane on the right hand side, it tells you what values you want where and all that. I was getting too many in, in the windows and it just, it was really not formatting the way I wanted it to. So that's something that I'm just going to play around with more. Um, and Dave, and then from, you're, you're, yeah, absolu you're absolutely uh, welcome. If you want to set up a half an hour one-on-one uh, -on -one and just goof around with it, um, just let me know. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm available. That's, that's fine. Um, and really what's funny is what this taught me was actually the amount of data and the amount of topics that you could get into because that you know we we had what two hours left the other day when we started this i actually spent the rest of the day the entire work day just looking at different sets of data out there and stuff that i could look at like i couldn't really my biggest challenge was deciding on what i really wanted to look at to be quite honest but so I did, uh, I played around with this forecast thing, another type of, so I went, I used the data, the data um, tab up here and I did this forecast sheet and I put a trend line in it and it kind of shows you, now I know there's a bunch of blanks over here, but I'll, I'll filter this table in just a minute. But when I do that, it gets rid of this, it gets rid of this chart, but you can see, um, 
you know, our, my data stopped in 20, but the forecast, you can see this is this heavy red line is the forecast, and then you have an upper limit, uh, an upper confidence, and a lower confidence. But this is the actual forecast, and although it is trending down until you know for the next 20 years or 19 years, you, it was interesting to me that these little peaks and valleys were still in there, just like they are up here in the 90s, you know. And so even though the forecast is to trend downward, it's still, for whatever reason, you know, different variables, I'm sure, but these little peaks were still in there. So I found that kind of interesting. Now, you know, so what I would like to, what I would probably like to do from here is I'll go in and let's look at some of these, some of the factors, you know, in these accidents and see if there's any trends there. But but anyway, it's pretty underwhelming from what the other folks in the class did, but that's what I've got so far. And like I said, as I, uh, now that I know, I, I feel a little bit better about um, going and getting, downloading the stuff after I talk to my IT guys. So I'm gonna go and get some more data sets and, and uh, look at some more information on this. Yeah, if you're, if you're downloading a CSV file, even though it's associated with Excel on your on your uh, on your machine, a CSV file is nothing but text. Uh, right. So there's no really, I mean, as far as files go, there's there's no no chance of uh, malicious malware or anything like that. So as long as you're downloading a CSV, now an Excel a, a, a worksheet can have all kinds of macros and danger in it. Um, right. <clears throat> You guys are probably old enough to do you remember Melissa in the 90, I don't know, 96 or 95, the Melissa virus. It, no, that's, I, that's, I the first, that's the first one I remember. It was a macro in Microsoft Word before any of us knew anything about, you know, this is, it, it, we'd all just gotten email, you know, pretty much uh, at the desktop in the military, um, 96 or so. And um, it was a macro in Word that would reach into your contacts and send a copy of itself and a message saying like, you know, dear Dave, check out this file I got from Bill or whatever, you know, and duh, you know, <laughs> we all clicked on it. And it, so it goes, yeah, it, it, it literally spreads virally. So if you've got 200 contacts, bam, uh, you're infected. And now two, your, your 200 of your closest friends are infected and it. It went, it went nuts for a day or two until we got it cleaned out. So yeah, macros yeah. in, in these, um, uh, office documents are definitely a vulnerability, but CSVs are just text, but I, I did want, so I wanted to say that. And then, uh, Dave, if you would go back to, uh, that bar chart that you had trouble with, um, I wanted to say something about this scale. Right yeah. That thing. Right. Um, uh, if you've got um, data and you're only using one scale, um, th Dave, this is a perfect uh, example of how um, one scale comparing things of you know greatly varying value um, can can just hose up your chart. So, and and I don't know how to walk you through it, but I'm gonna look it up. Uh, what would work really well for this, uh, if you would, and you're going to upload this to your assignment, right? Um, yeah. is a combo chart. Yeah, I looked at uh, that. Um, whoops. Hey, I got to, uh, so if you use the bars, there would be one scale, uh, probably on the right. Uh, so, so it would do a bar chart for, uh, for thousands of flight hours, which is the big value, you know, and then you can do a line chart. Ah, and then you can do a, a kind of a combo. There you go. That bottom. Yeah. yeah. Um, that sort of thing, but it, yeah, that, that, like I said, I, I would need to look up and play with your data because what you're looking for are two scales and that one is all using the same scale. You, right, you, the, right. the scale for the line chart would be on the left hand side. The scale for the bar chart would be on the right hand side, and it it kind of automatically gets it to where uh, the data is is visible on the chart for you 
a little, it cooperates yeah, and, a little bit better. And I did go through a bunch of these. I, I went, actually, I went through all of them. Some of <laughs> them were obviously not conducive to what you were trying to show. And I kept looking at the combo and uh, do, probably a bar. Do that. Uh, go down to combo and then uh, click on, right now, clustered column line is on there. Go to the right of that. And what's the next the next so option up above? No, above up up towards the top. There's those different types of charts. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the second one there? Yeah, what is that? There you go. Bam. Yeah. Put that. Pull that oh, one. Oh yeah, up. there you go. Look at that. Automagic. And make oh, that yeah, big. That, see, that does look a little bit. Make that big. Now then, now then, from here you would have to go in and give value to these. I mean, I don't wouldn't want it to say just series one, series two. I yeah, have you, to go in and rename these. Yeah, you can go in and edit edit the label. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Cool. All right. Um, I think that might be. Um, yeah, that's about it. I, it. Like I said, it wasn't a whole lot. Um, what I did do, though, is I, I know that this data was already because it just came from a table, but I did go in and try to do the stuff like, hey, remove any duplicates. And of course, there weren't any. Um, I, I did use some of the functionality that, that we've gone over, but this is about it. So anyway, a little underwhelming, like I said, but it it's it got me in here to play with it anyway. Well, hey man, it's not a it's not a competition, and and I'm sure just combing through all that data, uh, the different stuff that's available out there was probably eye opening. I'm I, I I'm it's with massive. you. Yeah, I mean, it's there's massive. just everything under the sun you could ever possibly uh, want to mess around with, and that's just on like Kaggle. And data.gov. If you Google, you know, open data sources, uh, just, just, it's just ridiculous out there. All the stuff that's available. Hey, Leela, welcome back. Did you get connected okay? Yes, I've changed locations. Can y'all hear me okay? Okay. Well, you're still right here for me. So, okay. <laughs> ready, ready to go when you are. Uh, Yes, let me share my screen real quick. <clears throat> uh, okay, Looks good. is everyone able to see my screen? Looks good. Okay, perfect. So um, what I wanted to do was take a look at uh, what regions of the U.S. are the most violent. Um, so I got um, crime uh, data from the UCR Uniform Crime Reporting from the FBI.gov, which is um, primarily what we use for crime data um, when I studied it in college. So I was leaning kind of on that. <clears throat> the main uh, thing that I'm looking at here is rate per 100,000 inhabitants. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the data set that I was using. Uh, looking at rates by states, I wanted to see, you know, which of the states are, start with which of the states are kind of the most violent. Um, again, you can see which ones fall underneath the violent uh, crime category here. Um, so going back to rates by state, you can quickly see Alaska, my home state, has one of the highest, if not the highest rates per uh, 100,000, uh, followed by New Mexico. Um, I wanted to be able to sort to see just what are the most violent states and what are the least violent states. Um, and then the main thing I wanted to look at was where are we at? So, um, sorry. Where where are we? Our, holy monkey, we're number four from the worst. Mm hmm. Yes. Golly. So. Leela, your audio just dropped out. Can anybody else hear her or is it just me? It's in my lifetime. There uh, you but go. I'm okay. Cool. I'm alive. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, so by region, uh, you can see uh, the West right here uh, is by far the most violent uh, state. Um, and I did that by taking the average of the rates uh, of the states that are in there. But you can see, obviously, that it does have um, both Alaska and New Mexico, which are, are to the highest, uh, most violent um, states. And 
So I didn't know that we were presenting today. Um, and what I was wanting to do was compare, take the uh, uh, homicide numbers uh, and compare those rates to um, European countries, uh, just uh, comparing US and Europe because um, a lot of, you know, we tend, we tend to think, oh, well, Is it me? No, I, I, I don't hear you. Yeah. Okay, uh, Leela, we lost your audio and the screen share. But uh, sorry. Can you can you hear me now? We can. I can hear you now. Let me. I don't know why it did that. Okay, I'm resharing my screen. You're back. Okay, I am back. Yes, so apologies, I wasn't aware that we were presenting today, but um, my next step was to take, uh, I don't know how much you heard, but my next step was going to be to take um, homicide numbers for the US and compare them to uh, similar, uh, similarly populated countries in Europe and see how they compare, um, because I think they're quite um, higher compared to other uh, countries that are developed or that are labeled as developed countries versus. Can you hear me? Now. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I, Sorry about that. I'm having some uh, connection issues. I wasn't having any yesterday, but today I am for some reason. I keep getting disconnected. Well, it's because you've got a presentation to do. That's that's why you're having trouble. Of course. Of Murphy's course. Law. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to say the um, I sent out in that email. Um, about this assignment uh, with sample data sources, I sent out a cool web scraper. I, it may be blocked at, by your work fireplace. Uh, I don't really know anything about the website, but it works. <laughs> I've used it on a couple of different uh, Wikipedia pages. So if you wanted to like go scrape, um, you know, homicide rates by country, there's a table for that <laughs> in Wikipedia, um, and it and it has the, uh, the you know the continent and the subregion. And the homicide rate, which is like per whatever, per million or per thousand. Um, so all that data is out there. Um, and it and that website downloads it to you in a convenient CSV. So um, I've used it several times. You, I mean, you can always <laughs> copy and paste a Wikipedia table into Excel, but it brings along a lot of garbage with it that you got to clean up that that, mm -hmm. um, that web scraper seems to be a little bit better at. Gotcha, gotcha. Anyway, keep going. Uh, well, I think I think that's all I had. Um, okay. But any questions or suggestions? All right. Yeah, that yeah. Right, the only uh, only comment I had was that uh, I'm putting a plug in for that web scraper. It's, okay, uh, I will. I will check it out. It uh, it just makes things easier. I, like I said, I I I, I haven't had a problem, um, and I've tried to write web. Okay, for for uh, if you've heard the term but not sure what it is, um, web scraping, um, is a way to go get data off the internet without really asking for it with by just using, um, what appears basically to a user um the html the 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 document um that you that your your browser renders instead of reading that data 
which is you know the HTML document and the associated images and and uh, cascading style sheets and all those web that web stuff. Instead of reading that into Chrome or Edge, you can read it into a program like that you've written with whatever Python or. Uh, it can be a web tool that scrapes, but it goes into the actual uh, the actual document that your browser is rendering and pulls out data um, based on different formats and whatnot. The most popular that I know of is going into a table, which is a you know there's a particular format so your browser knows how to make it look um, on on your screen, uh, but it'll go into a table. Uh, and pull out the columns and rows, uh, and it, it, you know if, if it's a quality scraper, it, it it's kind of magic. Um, but there's other other things that will go out and they'll scrape prices from Priceline or Hotels.com or Amazon or whatever, and it's uh, it's 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 a different format. It's more complicated, complex software. But I, I tried to write a scraper, a table scraper. Um, and uh, it's pretty complicated reading HTML as if it were data and then making sense out of it. Um, I, I, I tried for hours working on it and couldn't quite get it to work. But that one that I sent you guys uh, seems to do pretty well. Uh, and so Lee LeWin. Okay. Did we get... Regina back. We did not. Okay, so that's everybody that's ready to go today. Uh, so for we got another 20 minutes. Good. For the rest of the day, um, rather than cracking open, open uh, a brand new topic, I'm going to wait until the week after Thanksgiving uh, to start SQL. Um, so I wanted to do uh, another uh, another Python kind of a review, get back into Python so that we're not out of it too far because um, we are inching toward um, uh, actually doing analysis with Python. It would be uh, it would be legitimate of you guys to wonder um, why Python? Why do we care? Why do we care about Python? Um, because all we're doing is these little logic puzzles. Um, but uh, let me share my screen. So just real quick here. Um, do, 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 share everything. Um, let me see. I'm, I'm sure I got a... Um, basic plotting kind of yeah um notebook here oh, i think i'm gonna have to re rerun python i think i got out of it do, 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 do. one drive there we go Documents, Python, and then my overly crowded notebooks folder. Um, so like plotting, yeah, uh, this is a, a, a notebook. Um, I'll go into either uh, or parts of it. Everybody seeing my screen okay? Yes. Yeah, thank, got it. Thank you, Leah. Okay, so the main cool thing about uh, Python is in the libraries, in these, this functionality and importing, here, here's an import of a um, Seaborn is a, uh, a, a, a library that does good looking uh, charts, like kind of like Excel. Um, and it's got some sample data sets in it that you can work with. Um, and then, um, there is another library called pandas, like the bear, panda bear, um, that lets you work with data in, in columns and rows in a spreadsheet. Um, just And there's really nothing you can't do that you can do in Excel. You could do it with Python. It's just that 
it's it, it does it every time you run a python program and if you're you know maybe there's something you do with a data set like reading it in and deleting columns and then renaming some columns and then deriving a column based on like uh, paul did the uh, start date and stop date you know and thing you know and so you're generating new columns based on previous column you can do all of that in python um with that pandas library and it does it the exact same every time so it's kind of like writing uh, a macro in excel but folks are just moving towards python for doing all of this kind of data engineering extract transform and load sort of stuff um so like for example uh, uh seaborn uses pandas um and there's a uh, uh a data set inside of seaborn called the Anscombe data set and i'm sure like say hunter do you do you remember what's cool about the Anscombe data set have you heard had you heard of that one i'm i'm picking on you because you have that math degree uh not off the top of my head right now yeah it, it's uh, a it's a famous data set that shows why looking at data graphically uh is so much more powerful than looking at it looking at the numbers um i mean we all know that but this shows it proves it to you so uh uh what the anscombe wait, data wait. set go ahead is this the, is this the anscombe's quartet yeah the anscombe quartet it shows you that the difference between uh um data, data can have data sets can have the exact same statistics and be wildly different in what they really represent. So this is the Anscombe data set. It's, it's four sets of X, Y coordinates, uh, and they all have the exact same, um, like mean, median, whatever, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so th this allows you to look at, uh, Python allows you to look at, at spreadsheet data and then like this is a plot that doesn't tell you anything <laughs> we'll get into this here's a, a little bit closer a scatter plot still doesn't really tell you anything um but as we get into uh um uh, more depth with python um I'm, I'm trying to get down here to to this actual um plot that makes sense so we can here we go so so you can draw charts using Seaborn, using another library called Matplotlib. Um, you can draw graphs, you can run descriptive statistics, um, do pretty much anything that you would do in Excel, but there's a certain amount, you know, you got to get up to where you know what functions are and what parameters look like and, you know, kind of how to use the language before it makes any sense to you. So that, that's the only, that's my only point is to sh show you that we are headed somewhere with Python um, so that your comfort with the language will, will show you. Um, so the important about the, back to the Anscombe data set, uh, these are four different sets of data that have the exact number. There, there's 11 points in each data set. They all have a mean of nine. They all have a standard deviation of 3.31. Um, so so the, the descriptive statistics are the same for all four sets of data. But when you graph them, you can see that uh, they each one, data set one, data set two, data set three, and data set four, all look completely different, wildly different on a chart, which goes kind of goes back to um why you visualize data in the first place it just makes the nature of the data uh jump out at you so yeah this this data set one two three and four all have the same mean standard deviation but when you look when you look at it in a, in a chart um they, the 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 actual values are are wildly different so just 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 running the descriptive stats on a on a data set doesn't necessarily tell the tale but this is the kind of cool stuff that you can do. This is these these four uh, little subplots were generated using uh, the code up here in this code cell. And we'll get to all of this stuff uh, eventually. So that's 
I, I just wanted to kind of reframe why we care about Python. Why is this language such a big deal uh, to data analysts? Because um, yeah, once you once you get it into a pandas data frame, which I thought I had some, maybe in a different notebook. Here's some yeah, some other kind of all kinds of charts you can draw with. Uh, um, I thought. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, like this, th this stuff that's now on the screen is a data frame with two columns, scores and a percentage. And you can have a data frame with just like Excel, you know, with the lots of columns, lots of rows, and it lets you do, you know, auto magic stuff like, you know, like Excel does, you know, uh, calculating the sum of a column. Um, but it lets you do cool things like looping through the data and then using if then else logic um, to do uh, oh so much more. Okay, so that, that, that's, I, I'm just putting in a plug <laughs> for why we care about Python. That's all I wanted to, to present um, this notebook for. So what I want to do is close and halt this one and go back uh, to the, um, the, the four notebooks that we've used in the classroom um, and, and just reground what we've been over because uh, I've got the next five Python brain teaser problems posted to the classroom um, that I'd like you to work on for the rest of the day today. Uh, so remember, there's... Uh, and, and you have these notebooks. Guys, I don't ever code from scratch. I, I, I keep either notebooks open or a Google window uh, because there's just too many uh, syntaxes floating around in my brain to remember how to do any of this stuff. Um, so if there's anything in a notebook that I've given you that you can cut and paste, like a for loop or an if then else statement that you can then modify, you know, I, I suggest uh, uh, doing that sort of thing. So remember, we've got, uh, you know, sequential statements. And that's where line by line by line by line, the computer is going to do everything in that code cell. And I use the term program, right? A program kind of synonymous with uh, code cell in, a, in Jupyter Notebook, even though you can, you can break up that functionality, as we have seen, um, into more than one code cell. So remember, we've got sequential statements. We can do assignments. Um, we can print stuff out. Uh, we can check the data type that Python is assuming the data is. We can convert that type uh, either you know, from a string to an integer or, or vice versa. Um, we can get input from the screen. Uh, you can do you know, any number of uh, calculations, say all the math that you would uh, uh, normally think of doing um, in your, you know, your, your standard math. Um, and then, yeah, just a little bit more about uh, the math library. Well, libraries are like, if you've got a, you know, I'll use a tool analogy because, you know, I'm a tinkerer. Uh, if I'm doing an oil change on a car out in the driveway, I might grab the tools I need because I don't want to roll my tool chest out into the driveway. So I'll grab a, you know, oil filter wrench and a socket wrench and maybe a rag and whatever else I need for that job. And I'll, you know, go to the job with that limited tool set. That's kind of like what's going on with Python. You, you, if you had everything that everybody has ever written uh, in functionality, like Seaborn and like Matplotlib and like Pandas, and like math and so many others. Um, if you had that, when you first execute Python, it would be huge. So that's, uh, that's why we do libraries because it lets you pick just the tools that you will need so that it's a little more lightweight on your memory, disk space, all the above. Okay, so then, so we had you know sequential statements. Remember there's only three uh, three basic constructs uh, in any programming language. So we'll close and halt that one out. And then uh, remember we did three. Um, this is where you're, you're, you're cruising along and you're 
getting the computer to decide what to do uh, based on how many choices there are. You know, there's uh, A and B, uh, and then there's, you know, multiple choice, two choices. Um, uh, the, the if with no else is just, you know, if this is true, then do this little bit of stuff. Otherwise, I don't care. But if this is true, then, then do this stuff. Um, so you've got some, you know, some, some good examples in this notebook of the, uh, the syntax and, uh, and applications of, you know, single choice, two choices and multiple choices of things in a, in a Python program. And they can, of course, nest, you just, uh, tab in another level if you need to, and that's all up to the programmer. You can have nested uh, conditional statements like this. You can have nested loops within nested conditional statements and as, 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 to whatever level uh, is required by the logic of the program. And then remember an example of doing like a, a text menu. And then all of the, you know, the, the logic, the, the problem solving um, you need is, 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 is for, the, for, you know, for simple applications is in this notebook here. So between these two, two, three, and I'll bring up four, remember um, looping. Between those four, those three, I'm sorry, those three notebooks, it basically covers everything. And I apologize if the dogs are going nuts. I'm, I'm, sitting my grand dog while our granddaughter <laughs> doesn't have to listen to that all day. Um, and this is, a, this would be a great coding uh, exercise if you're, if you want to uh, chew that one, but uh, I've got five problems uploaded to the classroom that should be a bit of a challenge. So let me close that one out. And remember the last one was repetition statements and looping. So when you want to do the same set of things more than once, uh, there's ways to control that. And those are their two basic loops. Um, you got your, your while loop that we, we looked at, remember? Um, and then remember the thing about a while loop is, is it by its nature, when you first write it, it's an infinite loop. You've got to do something inside your code. That's the, the main thing I think uh, beginning programmers get into trouble with is writing a while loop that never satisfies faults. Uh, because while this is true, while balance is less than target, for example, less than or equal to target, it's gonna do these commands somewhere inside of your while loop remember you've got to uh, uh do the logic to to make sure that it doesn't um, uh, create an infinite loop do while more electricity <laughs> there was a, back in the day back in the mainframe days you would get your output you didn't you didn't even use a screen you turned in those good old punch cards you know like index cards uh, and you turn it into the, you know, the computer operator and your output came out on paper. Uh, and it, it, you know, it was called a do while more paper when I, <laughs> when I first learned it out in the, remember the old, uh, uh, white and green, um, fan fold paper with the holes along the side. <laughs> My, how far we've come. So that's, that's a while loop that you, you will use until some, you know, some condition is met and you have to program in the, the, the logic to make sure that works. Um, and if you want to do something a certain number of times, whether it's from one up to 10 or 20 down to four by twos or however, uh, you need to, to, to do something, a, 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 predetermined number of times you use a for loop 
And remember the, uh, the, the, the real magic with Python to control a for loop is the range function that will tell the for loop um, what to do, to go from one to 10, to go from 10 down to one, uh, to go by one, to go by twos or threes. Um, so here's some, some examples of your, uh, of your range function um, that, like I said, you know, that, that will control that for loop for you. Uh, a couple of the, the programming challenges uh, in our second Python assignment, um, have you uh, print out the format, like two digits and that kind of thing. Um, that's like I said, that, that's one of my weakest areas is formatting in Python. So uh, if you get it to work and it doesn't look quite right, you know, you, you got most of the way there. Uh, um, don't, you know, uh, don't kill yourself because you couldn't get it formatted quite right. Uh, one of the problems, uh, we'll talk about a header row. All that is, is before you go into the loop, you, you print this stuff. And it'll do it one time. And then when you go into the loop, you'll get these subsequent rows each time you go through the loop. Okay. And then, yeah, there's uh, more, more examples, more examples, more examples. So the, uh, um, and, uh, and this one's important too. One, one of the, the programs um, uh, programming assignments is you're going to need to accumulate value as you go through the loop, depending on what it is. So you'll have several accumulator variables that depending on what, what the user or you, what you type in, uh, you'll do some, some if then else logic and, and set and, and increment and an accumulator variable which helps you, uh, each time you go through the loop, you, you, you're adding stuff, you're adding stuff. And then when you're done with the loop, you've accumulated all your, all your values. And then you can use it outside the loop. You've got the, the, the finished accumulation. So this is a, a, when you're working with loops, this is an important concept. These accumulators, counters and counters and sentinels um, are important concepts. My dogs are going wild. Can y'all hear that? Yeah. yeah. Sounds like a kennel, doesn't it? Yes. I don't even, and I've got a perfect view of the front yard. There's nothing going on. Dogs. Anyway, any question? And again, you can nest loops. You can nest uh, if then else's inside of loops and loop and nest loops inside of if then else's and until you run out of screen. I mean, it, you, you know, depending on the, the, the complexity of the problem um, that you're solving, uh, there's any number of, uh, of uh, nested levels. You just got to play computer in your head. Um, when, I, when I start out, um, I'll often write a comment. Remember these, uh, these lines that start with a pound uh, are ignored by Python when you run it, but they help you read what in the heck it is you're trying to do. So I'll often start with comments. Like if I need, if I know I'm going to need like three variables to accumulate values as I'm looping, I'll, I'll just make a comment. I won't actually write the code. I'll just write a comment, need to declare three accumulators. And then if I know I'm going to need a loop, I'll say I need a for loop that loops 20 times, uh, from one to a hundred by fives or whatever. And so I'll write the comment out and kind of design. That's really, when you're doing these things, um, it's really important to think of what you're going to need pretty much from A to Z. Think of the entire problem as like, a, you know, like a math word problem and sort of design out. You can sketch it on paper. Um, you know, you can, you can do it in a notebook using comments and then come back once you've kind of got an idea of everything you need to do to solve the problem. Um, you come back and fill in um, the code uh, where you have put the comment in saying that, you know, I need, I need to do this. And then I got to, you know, calculate this here. 
uh, do the logic where if it's between these numbers, I do this. If it's between these numbers, I do that. You know, so comments can be a great way to design your solution prior to uh, starting coding. So let me see here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> For the rest of the day, uh, today, so a couple more hours, um, if you would please, uh, some of you will knock this out quickly, I'm sure, uh, uh, but if you would please bang your head against the wall on these five Python exercises right here. Python exercises two. Um, there is a notebook attached to this assignment right here that you need to download python problems number two dot ipynb um it's got the well i'll show you instead of talking about it i'll show you python problems two elementa p there we go bam so i i i put some hints in here in uh in comments to maybe help you get going, but there's uh, some some if then else and some looping um, in in these um, to help you. Nothing like doing it to learn it. So and remember, guys, uh, please shoot me a text if something is you know if, if you if you you're trying uh, and you need help, let me know. And uh, we can jump on a call real quick, or I can uh, uh, we can do a Zoom call or just a phone call, whichever it may be. So there's the five problems. If you could knock these out, or or, or at least partially knock them out, and get something uploaded uh, by Monday. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you're using your your classroom time here uh, to knock these out, or at least make a shot, take a shot at them. So those are your five problems for next time. Any questions before we adjourn uh, until Tuesday? You don't even want to know the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow. Asian or European? Huh? There you go. Okay, guys, um, holler if you need me and uh, enjoy your weekend. And I'll see you Tuesday and we'll, we'll, we'll finish out. Uh, well, there's no finishing. Python is huge. We're going to do a little more Python on Tuesday. Um, and I'm going to want to make sure we'll do a functional check. Um, be on the lookout for an email from me with your username, password, and then just a few parameters that you need uh, to get SQL Workbench uh, connected to our database um, in the cloud, uh, our MySQL database. And uh, don't sweat it if, if, if that doesn't work out. Uh, we'll do a functional check and walk through um, on Tuesday so that we'll be ready to go, no kidding, um, after the Thanksgiving weekend. Is anybody going to be out all week next week? that you know of already? Are we just taking the four day weekend? I think, yeah, that's all we're doing. Four day weekend, whatever. Yeah, Three. four day for me. Nice. My son's got to work. He works for, he's a SQL developer at Bumper to Bumper and they're getting Thanksgiving off, but not Friday. <laughs> now, you know, most people that have been there a while, he just started there a few weeks ago. Uh, most folks, I, I don't, even in the military, I don't remember the last time I worked the Friday after Thanksgiving, like in my life, <laughs> but not everybody is as fortunate as I have been. So, okay, guys, I'll see you Tuesday morning, um, at eight 30 and holler if you need me. Oh, right Have a good weekend. I've been a grandpa a whole week now. Yeah, it is so wild.
hold my little. Did they decide baby. on a name yet? Yes, her name is Estes. Hang on a minute, Violet Estes Violet Schaefer Estes like Estes Park, Colorado. That's where my very my, cute. It's different. It's it's a last name. There are you know Estes Model Rockets and Estes Park. I mean and, you know, uh, so it's it's definitely unique. There will not be any other Estes's <laughs> in class when she starts school. I don't think. Okay, guys, take care. We'll see you Tuesday.